Welcome to Super Nutrition Academy's health class with your host and registered holistic nutritionist, Uriel Kame. Tune in each week for up-to-date insights on breaking health news and best practices on how to eat for awesome health. It's time to get smarter, healthier, and regain your sanity in a world of information overload. And don't forget to join Yuri at supernutritionacademy.com so you too can master your nutrition and health. Hey guys, Daryl came here. Welcome to another edition, another episode of the Super Nutrition Academy Health Class. Today, I am joined by uh, two friends who help you poop better. And they are none other than Stephen Wrights and Jordan Reasoner. And in case you guys um, haven't heard of them, they are doing some amazing work with what they consider to be Paleo Brothers, uh, Paleo, uh, Paleo's little brother, as they call it. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in this, uh, in this interview. Um, but nonetheless, they specialize in helping you poop better, uh, especially people with celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and IBS, which are unfortunately very, very common conditions nowadays. Um, their mission is to help others get rid of their stomach pains using real food, supplements, and lifestyle changes. And the same ones that they needed to make to overcome their own digestive problems that were unresponsive to, to traditional medicine. So if you're listening to this and you have any kind of digestive distress, um, Jordan and Stephen have probably experienced it either personally or with their clients, and the work they're doing is awesome. You can learn more about it at scdlifestyle.com, which stands for the specific carbohydrate diets, but they can explain that. We'll, uh, we'll bring them in. So welcome, guys. Thank you, Yuri. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, it's going to be, I'm looking forward to this. So Stephen, why don't we start off by um, telling our listeners what the specific carbohydrate diet is. Sure. Yeah. So like you mentioned, um, it's kind of best to think about SCD as paleo's little brother because they're very alike and yet they're, they're definitely different. Um, what the big difference is, is, is that SCD is grain free. Um, but it's also starch free and it goes way back in the literature, but basically, um, a lot of forward thinking doctors back in the twenties and thirties were starting to notice that their, their patients didn't do very well when they had, uh, various types of carbohydrates in their diet. And so a line of thinking was started that, um, maybe they only did very well when they ate monosaccharides. And, uh, there's, there's three, um, basically three different types of carbohydrates. There's monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. So one molecule, two molecule, and many. And so what happens is that if you have digestive problems where the brush border, so the, that's basically like the villi in, in the small intestine, if they're damaged or blunted or, or inflamed in any way, they might not be releasing the enzymes that are needed to actually break down carbohydrates into monosaccharides, at which point the body can actually absorb them. So the specific carbohydrate diet removes grains, it removes all of these dye and polysaccharides, and basically is, is all about making your food from home, so it removes um, like gums and lots of other man-made additives that people with digestive problems really just don't do very well with. Um, there are uh, certain advanced forms of SCD, we like to call them, that allow like uh, soaked certain types of soaked beans and, and legumes. Um, we don't traditionally talk about them very much because uh, for most people, even the super healthy, a lot of them have trouble with uh, digesting those types of foods. Um, and then the other big change about SCD that maybe your listeners don't know about is that it allows um, lactose-free dairy. Mm -hmm. And so um, a big staple on SCD that um, maybe around 40 to 50 percent of people who do SCD use is a 24-hour uh, fermented yogurt. So you can ferment yogurt to the point at which lactose is basically non-existent, and then you still get a highly nutritious product that has a bunch of probiotics in it. Um, but we are kind of our mission at SCD Lifestyle is to sort of take the specific carbohydrate diet and use all the new research that's come out in the last 10 to 15 years um, and sort of update it, which means that, you know, acknowledging that there's a lot of people that can't handle dairy. There's a lot of people that can't handle eggs, nuts, and various other types of foods. So I'm sure we'll talk about that at some other point. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, so Jordan, just to bring you into this, you, so you guys mentioned nuts and corp. So basically trying to you know keep it to monosaccharides, um, again, very basic building blocks for easiest absorption. So are you basically, um, you know, for, for individuals thinking, okay, well, what about like tubers or starchy uh, root vegetables like uh, beets, sweet potatoes, uh, would those pretty much be off the list for, uh, for at least you know a temporary uh, perspective here? Great question, Yuri, and and thanks for having us here, man. It's it's yeah, fun sure. to be on the show with you. 
Uh, that's a good question. Like I said, in, in, in general, our goal with using a specific carbohydrate diet approach is, is really to heal the gut and get you to the point where your digestion is doing well enough that you can graduate up to a paleo type diet. That's why we call the little brother a paleo because we like to have people graduate up. And that's what Steve and I both did after we healed our gut. And so in the beginning, you know, like you said, we generally have people avoid those quote unquote safe starches from the paleo community because as you know, they do contain disaccharides that need to be broken down. So especially if people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, Mm -hmm. you know, that's something that's really going to be problematic for people with SIBO. Uh, It's going to feed bacteria in the small intestine. They'll probably gobble up that type of stuff before you can properly break it down and absorb it on your own. So we tend to have people avoid that in the beginning, especially if they have a test result indicating they have SIBO. And then as they heal their gut and improve their digestion, if they have test results showing they no longer have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the research really suggests that for long-term gut health, so for you to have a good um, gut microbiome long-term, safe starches are probably a good idea. So eating things like sweet potatoes or yams are going to be beneficial in in feeding the, the colon bacteria. So those are types of things that we we tweak based on an individual, but for the most part, we have people avoid them initially until they've done some healing and they've got some evidence that the SIBO is gone or has been handled, and, and you can move in introducing those types of things. Nice. So just to follow up on SIBO, um, again, this is a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. How, for, for those people listening who are wondering, well, how, like, how does this happen? How, how do I know if I have it? What are some... Um, some signs and symptoms of that occurring, uh, Stephen. Yeah, so uh, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth is actually uh, an overgrowth of good bacteria. So um, traditionally, the small intestine should have very minimal amounts of bacteria compared to the large intestine. And what happens in an occurrence like a SIBO or even a, a yeast or candida overgrowth is that you're getting these normal species up into an area of the body in an, a population size that's too big. And so they produce um, byproducts. Um, not only their metabolites uh, can cause problems such as they, they might produce more gas as they digest your food before you can, but they, they steal your nutrients, they can cause metabolic byproducts, but also when they die, they can cause, uh, their, their bodies can be toxic to us. So um, indications that you might have a SIBO infection would be things like uh, lots of gas and bloating, a carbohydrate sort of intolerance would be a way to put it. Um, you're not sure why, but eating carbohydrate-rich meals definitely makes you feel worse. Mm -hmm. Um, SIBO is actually um, very correlated to things like fibromyalgia as well as uh, acid reflux with, uh, I think, about 50% of people potentially having SIBO who have acid reflux. And somewhere around 70% or higher of those with fibromyalgia, the studies show, um, have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So it's very interlinked um, with a lot of chronic health issues. And we've definitely found through our private consulting practice that um, a a lot of people who are sort of unresponsive to dietary changes alone are are probably in a bucket of people who would want to get tested for it to make sure they don't have it. Okay, so let's let's assume that somebody does have SIBO. Um, what are the courses of action? Is it, it, I'm assuming it's a little bit more um, detailed than just taking some probiotics because um, it, it does seem like it's a little bit more of a specific issue. Uh, Jordan, do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, definitely. So there's, you know, one of our great friends, Dr. C. Becker is, is one of the best experts for SIBO that we're aware of. And we've had her on for quite a few podcasts uh, discussing the topic of SIBO. And in general, f- working with her and what we've also both experienced with SIBO, the, the, the action steps with SIBO are definitely, first of all, to change your diet, you know, cut out disaccharides, Um, get on a low carb, real food diet, right? Whether it's paleo, SCD, we recommend SCD only because of the uh, more focused uh, monosaccharide intake of carbohydrates. So, you know, that's the first step, primarily stop feeding the bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. So once you stop feeding them, in theory, you could starve them out uh, with diet alone. And that can take years in some cases. So in general, some therapeutic intervention can help. Uh, A couple of things that can help, First of all, uh, if you have an overgrowth of D-lactate-producing bacteria, which would be like the lactobacillus family, one of the most common families that are people take in probiotic form, and you take a probiotic that is a D-lactate-producing bacteria, that can really aggravate your symptoms. So a lot of cases, taking something like a soil-based 
probiotic like prescriptocyst can really help in terms of, of making sure that you're taking a probiotic that doesn't aggravate your symptoms and actually helps support you. Mm -hmm. um, and also avoiding things like fermented foods because, again, most fermented foods like sauerkraut, for example, are going to have the lactobacillus family. So, again, that can be a delactate producing uh, issue. Now, in terms of treatment, there's a lot of different antibiotic protocols. And if you go to uh, siboinfo.com, that's Dr. C. Becker's site. And she shares a lot of antibiotic protocols that can work that you can talk to your primary care physician about. However, you know, antibiotic protocols have their drawbacks, right? It's like a nuclear bomb to the gut mm -hmm. and it can be pretty gnarly. So there's also herbal protocols that work. Um, you know, I obviously recommend working with a, a skilled practitioner who maybe specializes in functional medicine that can help you work through uh, a SIBO treatment protocol that's herbal based. Yeah. Um, but a good herbal-based protocol should probably include some biofilm busters, so something like Clara Labs Interphase, and then also some antimicrobials, so any herbs that are going to be antimicrobial as well as maybe something like monolaurin. So uh, a good herbal protocol will have a biofilm buster and then come in and kill with some good quality herbs. And uh, from that place, you can really do a lot of work in terms of of getting rid of SIBO. And, and most importantly, I, I don't, I don't want to forget, retesting is really important. So not only looking at are your symptoms improving as you treat this thing, but also making sure that you follow up, you know, 30 or 60 days after a protocol and make sure it's gone. Uh, use, use good functional data to, to make decisions about whether or not it's gone. And if it is gone, you can start to try to introduce some of those safe starches like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And so where can people get tested? I mean, is there, is, are there kind of at-home kits that they can take and send in or are there specific uh, websites or, or clinics that, that do this stuff? Yeah, so there's um, two main tests that uh, people should be thinking about. The first is a uh, breath test. It's sort of the golden standard for small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And um, you typically have to have a primary care physician order this for you. You can do it at home, though. Um, so it's uh, it's typically not too expensive. Um, the, the issue really right now is that you it's sort of protected, and so you can't order it yourself. Okay. Um, so that would be the golden standard test. Um, the other test that's much easier to get that you can actually find online right now is a, a Metametric 0091. It's an organics acid profile that, um, so that's sorry, that was Metametric 0091. <clears throat> yeah. Metametrics. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, that's just an interesting name. I just find that like, yeah. Anyways, I'll let you, I'll let you go on there. <laughs> is it you don't, you don't like that test or no i just uh this is just such a it sounds like r2d2 like a really interesting type of uh testing name but yeah that's just don't, don't worry about me i'm just going off here <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah so the, it's a metametrics i mean it's an organics acid panel um so i think that might be the name but the actual test number so you don't get confused is 0091 okay. and um that's going to give you um byproducts basically of of the body and so these different strains of bacterial as they eat your food they're going to give off byproducts metabolites and this test will screen for high levels of uh of SIBO overgrowth of these byproducts um it, the other nice thing about the 0091 is that if you are having the symptoms you know gi distress those types of symptoms. Um, it's also going to screen for uh, candida overgrowth and it's uh, or, or yeast overgrowth. It might not be candida, but um, in general, it's the test that we like best right now uh, for sort of taking a snapshot of both. Hmm. Cool. That's, uh, that's helpful. Um, so in, in the work that you guys do with, um, with your clients and, um, and, and just in your own experience, why is it that a lot of people end up developing digestive problems is this is this starting with low stomach acid is it starting with not chewing their food is it a combination um what are some of the big things that people need to be uh, conscious of uh jordan i'll just put this out to you man that's a that's a million dollar question uh so there's so many things that can cause digestive issues with people um you know low stomach acid is one really obvious thing that you just mentioned that you know, we've written extensively about, and most of our clients have low stomach acid. I have low stomach acid. Steve's had low stomach acid. So, I have low stomach acid. Yeah, exactly. Everyone it's it's almost. honestly it's an epidemic. Yeah. And what's fascinating is that it's really counterintuitive to what we've been taught by conventional medicine over the last twenty, thirty years. 
you know, for the most part, if we're dealing with acid reflux or GERD or indigestion type symptoms, heartburn, whatever you want to call it, we're going to be given an acid suppressing drug, right? And the interesting thing is that it's counterintuitive to think that if you're having acid reflux or heartburn, that it's actually an indication that you have low stomach acid. It just doesn't compute for most of us. And What's interesting is that the research finds that hyperchloridia or too much stomach acid is extremely rare in the in the population. And what's more prevalent is uh, hypochloridia, which is low stomach acid. So that's what we're talking about here. And if you have low stomach acid, you're not going to break down your food very well. Uh, you need stomach acid secretion to break down, especially meat. You need it to digest meat. So if you're not properly breaking down the food in the stomach, that's kind of step one in the digestive process. Your food will tend to ferment. It'll ship to the small intestine pretty late. And at that point, the pH will be off. So your small intestine will not properly release bile salts, pancreatic enzyme, brush border enzyme. All that functionality will be diminished. And again, so you've got fermented kind of half digested food. You're not going to absorb nutrients properly from it. You're also going to allow bacteria to feed on it in your small intestine. Again, promoting small intestinal bacterial overgrowth like we just talked about. So again, you know, there's a lot of different things that can cause digestive problems. And I just dove into one rabbit hole because it's, it's an epidemic that we're seeing. And I think you're probably experiencing as well, Yuri. So that's a great place to start. And, and one of the most common things that we see. So if, if you're somebody who has symptoms like that, or maybe you have some digestive issues, low stomach acid is a great place to, to first take a look and also to, to research a little bit about um, supplementation with betaine HCL with pepsin, mm-hmm. that can really, I mean, it saved my life, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I was just not digesting food whatsoever. So many of our clients end up taking betaine HCL and testing it out very slowly. And uh, again, that can really help with somebody who has low stomach acid. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that's, uh, for me, is, has been a huge addition as well. And I think um, maybe, Stephen, you can talk about this a little bit as well, is is a lot of people think about, um, I don't know if a lot of people distinctly distinguish between HCL and digestive enzymes. And then they're kind of, they, they, they help to digest food, but they're not the same thing. So do you, um, I mean, for, for people who suffer from low stomach acid, you know, do you recommend uh, supplementing with, you know, the betaine H- HCL with pepsin? In addition to a digestive enzyme, or would you recommend people starting off just by getting their their stomach acid in check and kind of building that up over time first? Yeah, that's such a great question, Yuri, and I love that you you probably know the distinction here because a lot of people are glossing over this. And um, you mentioned chewing, so there's several like physical actions of the GI system that have to happen properly in order for us to even begin to absorb this food that we probably spent a lot of money buying and then a lot of time preparing. And so the first step is is chewing. You know, making sure you're taking time and chewing your food. The second physical action, as Jordan and you have just talked about, is that you need to have the right amount of stomach acid to be able to begin the process of breaking it down and getting to the point of being able to absorb it once it dumps into the small intestine. Another thing that Jordan mentioned is that after the stomach, uh, the, the transit time and basically everything that happens after that is all based on pH. So if you set the wrong pH at the beginning of the process, um, your, od- your odds of having good success at the end uh, go way down. And one of those things is that digestive enzymes, so typically pancreatic enzymes, only happen or, or only work in certain pH ranges. And, they're, and the timing also depends on the pH as well as when um, it's the body senses food moving through the system. Mm-hmm. So what we find is that basically anyone who has low stomach acid is typically going to benefit from having a separate supplement that is very uh, pancreatic digestive enzyme oriented because Already, you're kind of starting off in a hole when you have uh, the wrong pH level and the wrong acid level. And so um, we like to make sure that you have the right amount of enzymes for you to digest your food and the right amount of HCL. And what we found, what's been our experience um, for a lot of people out there, you can get the right amount of HCL pills. It might be two, it might be six, and that's going to really make um, everything feel a lot better. And then if you throw in like a really high quality digestive enzyme, it could be one per meal or even up to three or four if you're someone who has really bad um, digestive problems right now. But there's going to be a combination there as you sort of ramp up the dosages that can almost be like a light switch. And there's not a lot of supplements out there that can really make um, snap improvements in people's health. But these two 
two products, when you um, kind of play with them and you do are suffering from these problems, can really turn off digestive problems very fastly. Yeah. And are the um, like the supplementation guidelines for HCL or even digestive enzymes? Are these are these things that over time the body will naturally start ramping up more HCL production, or is this a protocol that people need to stay on pretty much indefinitely? Uh, Jordan. That's a good question. It really depends. It depends on the root cause, right? So these these things we're talking about right now uh, with with B10 HCL, with pepsin supplementation alongside a good quality digestive enzyme, we're talking about you know supplementing with things that are going to immediately relieve you of some symptoms, mm-hmm. which are going to improve your life. But again, underlining this is a root cause. And we talked about earlier hypochloridia, so low stomach acid. What's the root cause there? So if you're somebody who wants to take B10 HCL with pepsin and you find that it really improves your digestion and you're taking enzymes and you find that that helps you even more, so the combination of the two really relieves a lot of your symptoms, the question still remains, what's causing you to have low stomach acid and what's causing you to have low uh, enzyme production? And there's a multitude of things that can cause low stomach acid. Some of the common things that we find with our clients, first of all, stress. So people who are in adrenal fatigue, dealing with chronic stress, whether it be emotional stress uh, from work or physical stress, like training for a marathon, being a triathlete, that type of thing, Mm -hmm. Um, abusive relationships, uh, the loss of a family member, moving, whatever it might be, those stressful types of things can be enough to su- suppress stomach acid to a level where you just stop digesting meat very well. Um, also, a common thing that we see with our clients is the H. pylori infection. Those are notorious for suppressing stomach acid. So if you have a bacterial infection of H. pylori that's going untreated, that can be something that suppresses stomach acid until you, until you go in and treat it. So there's also people who have you know, epigenetic methylation issues. Mm-hmm. that just cause chronic low stomach acid secretion. So getting those types of things looked at and, and supplementing and treating those types of things can help. It, it really depends on what the root cause is on whether or not you need to supplement with these things for life or whether you can back off of them. Some people, if they get their B10 HCL with pepsin dosage really dialed in, that will provide a good environment for normal enzyme function in the small intestine, and they don't need enzymes long term. But like in my case, I'm still taking B10 HCL. I've been on it for about five years, and uh, and I don't know. I mean, when I try to back off it right now, I still have issues. So I think I haven't totally got to the root cause of my low stomach acid yet, and that's really the question: is is are you getting at the root cause of what you're what you're supplementing for at this point? Yeah, it's almost. I mean, it's also, I think a lot of people almost beat their stomachs to death over years of, of poor food choices and stress. And it's it's almost like abusing another human being. They're not going to become very empowered in the long term if you continue to do that. Um, let's let's talk about poop, uh, Stephen. Why, why is poop important? Oh, man. Well, it's fun. I mean, poop's <laughs> fun. That's why it's important. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's only... You know, we're not all doctors. We don't all have a ton of money. We don't all like getting pricked and doing tests all the time. So I think why poop is really so awesome is that there's only a few outputs that we can take stock of on a daily basis as a human that are indicating how our health is. And I think, you know, if the basis of your health is what you intake to be able to provide your body with the ability to do its things, then paying attention to the output, your poop, is going to give you a good indication if you're actually um, you know, assimilating, getting the nutrients you need to live and be healthy and avoid disease. And um, if you're not digesting properly, if you're having um, you know, bad poops, then you can be pretty confident that something's going on with you. You have some underlying dysregulation that um, until you get it fixed, you're going to continue to show this uh, bad poop thing. So you definitely want to track them on a daily basis. Um, if you're someone who's super healthy and and uh, you're, you're just kind of getting aware of your body, you'll start to notice that maybe going on a cross-country flight or something, just the stress of that will change your poops, your bowel habits. And so that's where kind of just becoming body aware and um, starting to learn about what what normal is and what optimal is, I think, are are really good ways to stay healthy in the long run. Nice, nice. Yeah, poop is, uh, it's it's awesome. And I think a a lot of people don't understand what, um, 
you know, what constipation is in the first place. I remember having a client uh, several years ago, and I was talking to them about this, and they were saying, yeah, you know, I, I'm pretty regular. I go to the bathroom once or twice a week. And I was like, <laughs> sorry, once or twice a week? So uh, it's, I, th- I think this kind of this education that you guys are providing with respect to you, uh, digestive health as well as obviously poop is, is massively important because uh, more people need to know about it. In terms of identify, so if you're to you know, do your number two, look back in the toilet, uh, Jordan, what are, what are one or two things you want to be looking for that would be um, a, an indicator of, of, of good stuff? And maybe what are one or two things that you may want to look at or that would, that would identify something as being a problem uh, digestively? Uh, the elusive perfect poop. Uh, we we have three criteria that we share with people that you can use kind of as a framework to understand what a perfect poop is and understand if you're outside of that range. So the first criteria is how well formed is it? If you've never seen the Bristol stool chart, I highly recommend that you Google Bristol stool chart and you'll see a beautiful poster of seven different types of bomb movements. And there's pictures and descriptions of what they are. And the it's a scale of one through seven. And it's been published in scientific research. It's a great way to understand where you're at. And a one is a very constipated, hard pellet-like stool. A seven is a very watery diarrhea. So right in the middle, like a four or five, is a nice, elongated, like smooth snake. That's going to be... A number four or five on the bristle stool chart is going to be a very well-formed stool. And so that's kind of the first criteria of how well-formed it is. So look up the bristle stool chart and kind of get a, get a picture of where you're stacking up in terms of one through seven. The second thing is uh, how easy is it to pass? And there's a continuum there too. So on one of the spectrum, you have somebody who's sitting on the toilet pushing and pushing and pushing. And I think that's a common thing in our culture. If you look at Western culture, you know, I I was growing up, we had a stack of readers digest in the, in the toilet, you know, in the bathroom. And, um, and we had magazines. And if you go to like my grandma and grandpa's house, they have stacks of magazines in there. And it's funny. Now we have iPhones and we can sit there for as long as we need to. And, Work on our iPhones. So it's funny. It's kind of a joke, uh, you know, in, in the movies for a guy to throw a newspaper under his arm and go into the, deba- into the bathroom for a half hour or so. And that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is what I experienced in my life with my chronic diarrhea, which was extreme urgency. Like, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can hold it. And you barely make it to the toilet. So that's another end of the spectrum. So in terms of how easy is it to pass, you want to be able to have good control of the urgency. And you also don't want to have to be pushing. So you want to just be able to stroll in there, sit down, have it come out nice and easy and get right back up. Pretty simple. Not a lot to think about. Gets done pretty quick. That's another criteria to look at where you're stacking up in terms of how easy is it to pass. And then the third criteria is really frequency. So how much are you using the toilet? How many bowel movements a day are you having? Uh, In general, there's a lot of different opinions about this. Um, And I think everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's digestive system is going to be a little bit different depending on what's going on in your life, what you're eating, how much you're eating, that type of thing. But in general, one to three bowel movements a day is considered pretty normal. Mm -hmm. So some people need to have a bowel movement every time they eat. So the food comes in, food comes out. Uh, three times a day typically is pretty normal for them. Some people, once a day in the morning is normal for them. And it's kind of a continuum as well. So one to three a day is pretty good. Generally, if you're going every couple days, like you said, Yuri, if you're going a couple times a week, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, if you're going um, 10 to 15 times a day like I did for a long time, that's a problem. So in general, those are the three criteria of how we look at a perfect poop. And if you're outside of the norms in any of those three areas, that's an indication that you've got a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are those are really helpful. Um, just kind of finishing up here. Now, you guys obviously specialize in this area and you've worked with tons of people with digestive disorders. Is your message to people that no matter if you've got IBS, celiac, or whatever it is, how, however damaged your gut is, that there is hope that you can repair it. Um, is that is that the message you want to send people? Yes, of course. I mean, I think that when you start to dive into the rabbit holes of all of these various disorders of the gut, you end up out at the other side with sort of the same uh, root causes. 
um, adrenal dysfunction, hormone dysfunctions, uh, infections, uh, detoxification issues. And so we kind of uh, hopefully are walking, talking um, people of hope that, you know, we could bounce back from several, you know, myself, I had H. pylori, I had candida, I had SIBO, I had all these different infections, I had stage three adrenal burnout. Um, And yeah, it took a few years to get back to the robust level of health I now enjoy. And I can't just eat McDonald's every day, that would be ridiculous. But all of these um, bad, you know, problems are, are, in our opinion, sort of just ending up further down the chronic health ladder. And so it might take you longer to get back up to the top of the ladder, to get back up to the robust level of resilient health that I think most of us want to be able to enjoy. But yes, I think if if you're someone, you know, the first step is is a lot like what you talked about. You're having a great diet, making sure that you're you're keeping your stress low, having a prudent exercise program, doing those base level things. And then if you're someone who this digestive thing has been a problem, it's a thorn in your side, it's it's uh, it's really bad, it's Crohn's or, or ulcerative colitis, um, man, dig in. Find a way to, to work with a practitioner. You know, obviously we have a consulting practice you can come join, but I know Yuri, you, you talk with a lot of people who would be totally competent to work with you to find the root causes of why you're still sick, even though you're making uh, good dietary choices, good exercise choices and reducing your stress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great message. And I think it's important too, because I think especially in this, this day and age of misinformation and, and, and marketing and all that kind of stuff, it's very easy for people to lose track or lose sight of the fact that you can't really improve your health by eating a specific, specifically just five foods, like the five foods that'll burn belly fat or whatever. Um, we've seen those ads all over the internet. And unfortunately, there's a little bit more complexity to most people's bodies than that. But nonetheless, I want to thank you guys for taking the time uh, for sharing your wisdom. I, this Again, this is a topic that I personally love. Um, and I think it's it's an area that a lot of people need to have a better understanding of. So I just wanted to thank uh, Steve and, and you as well, Jordan, for taking the time today. And for everyone listening, you guys can learn more and check out their stuff and follow their um, their awesome wisdom at scdlifestyle.com. And they've got a ton of great information there, which I'd highly recommend you check out. Um, any final words from you guys before we finish off? It's been fun, Yuri. Thanks for having us on. It's always fun to talk about poop because that's what we like to talk about and that's what we like to help people with. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to connecting with you guys soon. Thanks again. We'll see you guys in the next episode.